Hello, this is Calculus 1, Lecture 10a, Proof by Contradiction and Rolle's Theorem. So today what we're going to do is one of the absolute coolest thing that we do in the course. Um, so, I mean, depending on, it's the coolest or second coolest, depending on how you think about FTC th uh, 1, which we do at the end. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to go over, there are a lot of theorems in Module 3, um, and they kind of flow in the module four. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go over the theorems and how they depend upon each other in the proofs. So we're kind of going to go over what we're doing and why we're doing mean value theorem and what's important about it. Um, and then what we're going to do is really cool. We're going to do proofs by contradiction. So, um, and we're going to do the most famous of these, the proof that the square root of two is irrational. Now, this is something that your book has like a little blurb about. Um, and it's it's one of the things that got cut when they went from the big book to the small book. And if you look at the life science book, it's actually back in there in the in the thing. So as I said, it's got this little blurb in it, but we're actually going to do proof by contradiction big time. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna focus on that in today's class. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do Rolle's theorem, and we're going to prove it using contradiction. And then we're going to do some examples using contradiction to prove things using Rolle's theorem, and then Rolle's theorem, and then we're going to state the mean value theorem. Now this is such a four point two in your book, but today this lecture and the next lecture are both on the same section. So these pr these problems that I've listed here. Are for both days so it's not just mod it's not just today's lecture that these problems these problems are today's lecture and the next lecture okay so let's dig in here um let's just talk about this there's tons of stuff here so let's talk about modules three's theorems now um and the theorems overall now there's just a ton of them um, using the definition of the derivative, we did Fermat stationary point theorem last time, and we mentioned the extreme value theorem last time as well. You need to take analysis one if you want a formal proof of that. We kind of just said, uh, it's intuition, it's given. Um, if you want the proof, the full proof of that, that's kind of, that's a 4,000 level course in the math major, um, with tons of prerequisites, and it's called analysis one. And it's a very cool class. It's kind of separates mathematicians from, uh, uh you know, engineers type thing. Um, okay, so, and again, there's a lot in this section. So today we're, we're going to do this Rolle's theorem. And then Rolle's theorem, you use it to prove a lot. Now, you use it to prove L'Hopital's rule, some extended mean value theorem. And then you, you, the important thing for us is we're going to use it to prove the mean value theorem. And then we're going to use it to prove the antiderivatives of vertical shifts. Now, there's so many theorems in here that I couldn't possibly cover them all, the proofs for them. And I wouldn't want to, right? Some of them, so I've chosen the ones that kind of follow this path to the fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, part two. So th th those are the things that we're going to prove. Now, we're going to use these other things, but you use the mean value theorem to prove the first derivative test, the second derivative test, all the concavity tests, all the increasing, decreasing, basically all that stuff that we're doing in class and activities, the intuition, the formalization of it comes with, uh, the, it can be proved with the mean value, has to be proved with the mean value theorem. And what I'm going to do in the description below, I'm going to link uh, videos to the things I'm not proving. So today I'm going to link videos to stuff like the extended mean value theorem and Lipitor's rule. Next time I'll link stuff to the mean value theorem. And then we've got this theorem, the antiderivatives are vertical shifts of each other. And that we're going to need the mean value theorem. So this stuff right here, these two things are next time. So this thing right here and this thing right here, that is the focus of next time. Now, um, again, today's focus is going to be on Rolle's, Rolle's theorem and uh, proof by contradiction, the method of proof by contradiction. Then what we're going to do is once we have these two things, the extreme value theorem and the definition of the integral, the definition of the derivative, and again, two cops, we're going to use those to prove FTC1 in module four. But those two, this right here, we're going to need to prove FTC2. And this is actually the useful thing. This is the really cool thing and the intuitive thing. This is the useful thing that you need for calc two in order to evaluate derivatives. It's also called the evaluation theorem. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of what all the relationships between these things are. Uh, it looks like this. At some point, I'm going to make a VZO chart of it. All right. So if we look at all these things, um, 
The first thing on our list kind of after this is Rawls Theorem. Now, in order to prove the Rawls Theorem, we're going to use proof by contradiction. So what is proof by contradiction? If I wind up with a contradiction, a proposition that is both true and false, this is bad. So if P implies Q and P implies not Q at the same time, P must be false because we don't want Q and not Q to exist at the same time. Okay, And the most famous of these proofs, and this is really cool, is the proof that the square root of 2 is not rational. So let's do the example, uh, the example of this style of proof. Okay, So recall x is a rational number if I've got an integer p and a positive integer q, so that x equals p over q. So rational numbers are things like 1 half, 1 third, 2, right? These are examples of rational numbers. And speaking of that last one, negative 6, 2, one of the properties of rational numbers that you might, that you probably remember from grade school is that all rational numbers have a reduced form. So like negative 6 over 2 would be negative 3 over 1. That is the reduced form. It means that there's no integer that divides both P and Q evenly. All right. I mean, you know, so that you get a whole number. All right. So what we want to do is we want to prove that the square root of 2 is not a rational number. And the way we're going to do this is just go, eh, suppose otherwise. Indeed, that's my basically my whole strategy. Eh, suppose otherwise. Now, let's assume that the square root of 2 is true, is, is rational. Well, what would that mean? If the square root of 2 was rational, that would mean that there exists integers p and q, both positive, because the square root of 2 is positive, so that um, p over q is the reduced form of the square root of 2. So I'm just, right? That's what it would mean for, for the square root of 2 to be rational that I could express it as a reduced form fraction. Let's just multiply both sides by Q. Okay, so all I did was I multiplied the Q over to the other side and then I squared everything, right? So if I square everything, I wind up with 2Q squared equals P squared. Okay. Well, that means that p squared is an even number, right? It's some integer multiplied by 2. Well, if p squared is even, that means that p must be even, right? Because if p was odd, then odd times odd is, is odd again, right? If I take two numbers that are odd and I multiply them together, I wind up with an odd number. So that means that in order to wind up with an even number, p must have been even to begin with. Just clean that up a little bit. Okay. Now, if P must be even, that means that I can divide it by 2 and get another even number. That means there's some positive integer K so that P equals 2K. Right? And so P over 2 is K. Um, and that means that 2K equals P. So that means that 2q squared equals 4k squared. All right, well, let's divide by 2. q squared equals 2k squared. k is an integer. Uh, that means that q squared must be even. Now, what's the problem? Wait a minute. What did I say was true way at the beginning about p and q? Uh, I said P over Q is reduced, but P is even, and Q is even. But P and Q are both even, meaning both can be divided by 2. Okay, so what I did there... I did the whole proof. What did I do? 
Eh, suppose otherwise. Suppose the square root of 2 was rational. Then that means that there exists a p and a q, so that p over q equals the square root of 2, and p over q is the reduced form of that fraction. Right? But that led me to the conclusion that p was even. But p being even meant meant you know when I when I squared the when I squared the two I wound up with another two I wound up with two twos over here and a single two over here I wound up with a two on this side of the equation making q even and that's a contradiction both p and q cannot be even because I said that p over q was reduced and that's absurd. This method, the technical term for this method, is called reductio ad absurdum, or a reduction to the absurd. Okay? That's it. I just proved that the square root of 2 must be irrational. That's cool, isn't it? As I said, this is one I think, this is the probably the most famous proof in mathematics. Not the most famous theorem, that's the Pythagorean theorem. This is probably the most famous proof. And it is just cool. Okay, so what was the point of doing all that? Well, the point to doing proof by contradiction is to prove Rolle's theorem, okay? And it's this very intuitive idea. So last time we did extreme value theorem and Fermat's theorem. Today, what we're going to do is Rolle's theorem. So um, if F is continuous on a closed interval and differentiable on the open, on the interior, and if f of a equals f of b, in other words, if I end where I start, then there's some point in the middle where f prime uh, of v equals zero. There's some point in the middle where f prime of that thing equals zero. So if I have a ball and I toss it up in the air and I catch it at the same height, there's some point in the middle where the derivative was zero. That's the idea. I had either a min or a max in the middle, at least one. I could have had multiple points where f prime of v equals zero, but there had to be at least one of them, right? Um, and there, that's where the derivative is zero. Okay, so it's, it's, it's intuitively, and you can actually kind of see how the proof is going to work, but it's, it's kind of a hard thing to formalize, okay? So let's go through. It's easier to formalize with proof by contradiction. So let's go through it. What we're going to do is we're going to assume otherwise, and we're going to play where's Waldo with the global min and global max. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and start it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to suppose otherwise. I'm going to suppose that F is continuous on the close, differentiable on the open. The endpoints are equal to each other, but there is no V in a b so that f prime of v equals zero so let's set this up okay since f is continuous um uh on a b the extreme value theorem tells me that there must be l so that f of l is the global min and there must be a v a, a u so that f of u is the global max so let's go ahead and just write that out Okay, so all I did with there was write out formally what I meant, right? If f, f is a global min and max on AB, that means that there exists an L in, the, in AB so that f of L is the global min, and I'm just going to call that big L, okay? That's the Y value that's associated with f of L. And there's some value, likewise, that f of U is the global max, and I'm just going to call it big U. What's true here? Well, f is differentiable on the interior. Okay. Now, suppose that L is in the interior. So, L either has to be A or B, right? If, 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 if Fermat stationary point theorem tells me that the min... If it's in the interior, the derivative would be zero. And I can't have the derivative be zero. So this L must be at the lower end. And remember that the, the, the two 
endpoints are equal to each other, right? F of A equals F of B, which means that L is F of A equals and F of B. What just happened there? F of U and F of B are equal to each other. So that means that U equals both F of A and F of B. In other words, so I've just said that the endpoints are both the largest and smallest things. But that means everything in the middle. Wait a minute, what does that mean about the stuff in the middle? But these things are equal to each other, right? The upper and the lower have to be equal, right? If everything's equal, that means everything is equal to the upper bound. Um, that makes f of x a constant function. But if f of x is constant, its derivative is zero everywhere. Right? So, what did I try to do? Well, I said, suppose otherwise. <laughs> suppose otherwise. Well, that means that somewhere I have a min or a max because of the extreme value theorem. Well, it can't be in the middle, so it must be the two endpoints. But the two endpoints are equal to each other. So, that means that the min and the max are equal. F of L equals F of U. But that means that F of X is equal everywhere it's a constant function it's always churning out u or big u or big l well that's absurd that means that that would mean f prime of x would be zero everywhere so in an effort to stop it from being zero anywhere i actually made it zero everywhere and that's just crazy so it turns out that there must exist a v so that uh an a b so that f prime of v equals zero and that's the proof. Okay, so let's use this thing. Let's do an example where we actually use this thing. What we're going to do, remember from before, actually, I think I did something similar already where I proved that this particular function or, or something similar had at least one real root. What I want to do is I want to use Rolle's theorem to prove that it has no more than one root. Okay. So recall that means that u u as a root if there's a place where f of u equals I'm sorry u is a root if f of u equals zero. So my strategy here is going to be to use Rolle's theorem. I'm going to suppose otherwise and use Rolle's theorem. Okay. So what does it mean to suppose otherwise? Well, let's suppose there are two x values so that um, both equal zero. Right. I've said it as no more than one. So suppose there are two. So suppose I've got two real roots, okay? Well, what's true here? Well, I'm gonna use Rolle's theorem. So what do I need for Rolle's theorem? What are the conditions here? F is continuous on the X, on the uh, whole inner, on the closed. F is differentiable on the interior. F of A equals F of B. All right, so flipping back, Okay, so I have my other two conditions, and then f of a and f of b are both equal to zero, so f of a equals f of b. So that means that f meets all three conditions of Rolle's theorem. Okay, so there has to be some u in the middle so that f prime of u equals zero. Well, let's look at f prime of, a, of, of x here. F prime of X, 3X squared plus 1. Well, 3X squared plus 1 is never 0. It's actually greater than 1 for all X. Right? Anything I throw in here, right? I'm going to add. So if I throw in 0 to this number, I wind up with 1. Okay? If I throw in anything else, I'm going to wind up with something greater than 1. 
So that means that f prime of, a, of u must be greater than zero, since u is a perfectly good x. And this is a contradiction. Right? It, it, the derivative is always positive, therefore f must have at least one root. Now, that's how we use it. So there's something interesting here. I actually said something a little bit more. I didn't just say that, that this thing was greater than zero. I actually said that this thing was greater than or equal to one. So I said something more about the slope. Well, that's what the mean value theorem lets us do. And we're going to talk about this more. But let's go ahead and define some terms and just define mean value theorem for next time. The slope of the secant line is what we expect it to be, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So there's some secant line here, right? The line connecting a and b, f of a and f of b like that. So this slope here, I'm just going to call mab. That's the slope of the secant line. So the mean value theorem says I can lose this last condition that they're equal, and my last condition, the, my conclusion changes. So if f is continuous on the ab and differentiable on the open, so continuous on the closed, differentiable on the interior, there must exist a u so that f prime of u equals mab. So f prime of u equals the slope of the secant line. Um, so there's some place in the middle where the slope of the tangent line equals the slope of the secant line. And we're going to pick that up next time. So next time we're going to start here. So just to remind you what we did today, what we did today was we talked about kind of the overview of where we're going. Then we did the, um, we did proofs by contradiction and that really cool proof that the square root of two was irrational. Then what we're, what we're going to continue to do, then what we did was we proved uh, Rolle's theorem, and, what, and then we did an example. Next time what we're going to do is we're actually going to prove the mean value theorem and then use it to do some other stuff. Um, and then we're going to use it to prove that antiderivatives uh, are vertical shifts of each other, which is going to be very important for us. Okay, so that's what I had for you today. I uh, hope it weren't too many proofs. I hope you thought it was cool like I did. Um, and I will see you next time.